It might take a week, a month, a year, but for the sake of a more perfect version of ourselves and our country and our future, still very much present in the hearts and minds of tens of millions of Americans, we have to do this thing, the introspection, the self-reflection, the internal audit of what exactly went wrong. And it has to start right now. However painful that process might be for many of us, there is an urgent need as we speak to transform, to be relentlessly curious about our country, our friends and neighbors who voted for Donald Trump, to get closer to that reality, not farther away from it, and to view right now apathy and disengagement as completely counterproductive, to be unwavering in our commitment to better understand why exactly bipartisan urgent messages about preserving democracy, demanding decency, and protecting women didn't prove persuasive to enough people Tuesday. This morning, in front of his assembled cabinet and others in the Rose Garden on the grounds of a White House still occupied by President Joe Biden, he shared this message with the American people. Listen. Setbacks are unavoidable, but giving up is unforgivable. Setbacks are unavoidable, but giving up is unforgivable. We all get knocked down. <clears throat> but the measure of our character, as my dad would say, is how quickly we get back up. Remember, a defeat does not mean we are defeated. We lost this battle. The America of your dreams is calling for you to get back up. That's the story of America for over 240 years and counting. It's a story for all of us, not just some of us. The American experiment endures. We're going to be OK, but we need to stay engaged. We need to keep going. And above all, we need to keep the faith. Setbacks are unavoidable. This was the important part. Giving up is unforgivable. So it is with that mandate from President Joe Biden in mind that pro-democracy forces must today begin a vital longer term project. That is not to change any of the values held so dear by so many, but to find a better way to communicate them and to persuade more Americans justifiably feeling like they have to choose between the two. People justifiably more concerned with the cost of everything, like their next car payment or their rent payment or groceries or daycare, or whether or not they can really swing that trip to Disneyland that they promise the kids or hope to. Perhaps it does start and end with just this, how we talk about and communicate and feel people's deep anxiety about our economy. According to the Washington Post, quote, two thirds of voters rated the economy as not so good or poor compared to just one third who rated it as excellent or good, according to network exit polls. Of the voters who rated the economy negatively, 69% of them voted for Donald Trump. A significant margin. Make no mistake, Vice President Kamala Harris was running on a strong economy. She had a plan to make it better for everyone, and she talked about those plans in every one of her public appearances. But there was a breakdown. The American people preferred, said they preferred, someone with no such plan. Vague promises about musings of someday having a plan, promises about changing things or making things better. Um, someone whose own running mate had once called him, quote, America's Hitler. That's who they chose. So the urgent work today and tomorrow and forever long it takes for Democrats and anyone who was welcomed inside the pro-democracy tent to do this work, however painful it may be, however uh, much we'd rather binge our favorite network shows. This is what has to start today for the sake of our kids, for the sake of their kids. It's time to get to work. No one better to start this conversation with than some of our most favorite experts and friends, political strategist, MSNBC senior analyst, Matt Dowd is here. With me at the table, anchor of MSNBC's 11th Hour, NBC News senior business analyst, Steph Rule, and David Jolly, a former Republican congressman from Florida, now an MSNBC political analyst. So Matt Dowd, I'm gonna tell a story because I feel like our conversation last night bookended our conversation around 
I don't know, 10 or 11 p.m. on election night in 04, when you, like, kind of two parts Carrie Matheson, one part mad scientist, cracked the code on the exit polls, figured out what was going on, and were able to accurately predict how 04 would end. I feel like last night you cracked the code on Tuesday night. Explain to our viewers. Sure. Well, thank you, Nicole. Um, I mean, this is a process that I think for everybody is going through. And I think w the way we have to look at this is we have to understand what happened before we can actually really talk about it clearly and what went on in the course of this. I'd like to say first, democracy worked Tuesday. It may have not got the result, but 50 states had 50 elections. It all functioned. Probably in the end, 160 million people will have voted. It's going to be counted. It's, uh, it's going well. So democracy works, um, even though the end result right now is dissatisfactory for a lot of people. I think that what happened, and it caught, I think, a lot of us because we assumed because of the Donald Trump was disliked by a majority of people and distrusted by a majority of people and was seen as extreme by a majority of people, that that would rule the day. And on, a, on Election Day, that same thing happened. A majority of the people that came to the polls on Election Day disliked Donald Trump. A majority of the people on Election Day distrusted John, Donald Trump, and a majority of the people on Election Day thought he was too extreme. But the problem fundamentally, which often happens in politics in a presidential election, is your fate is determined by the viewpoint of the incumbent president. And so on Election Day, according to the latest NBC exit polls, Joe Biden's approval rating was 40 percent, a net minus 18 approval rating. Every other president who's run for reelection in modern times ends up on Election Day with the same number they have in approval. So Barack Obama in 2012 had a 51 percent approval, got 51 percent of the vote. In 2004, George W. Bush had a 51 percent approval, got 51 percent of the vote. When Jimmy you know, Carter lost, he had a 41, 42 percent approval. He got 41, 42 percent of the vote in 1980, every single time. And even a vice president, think of 1988, when Herbert Walker Bush ran against Mike Dukakis. George, I mean, Ronald Reagan's approval rating was 55 percent. George Herbert Walker Bush got 53 percent. So the expectation with those fundamentals, ignoring all of the other data, and that approval was driven by perceptions of the economy, as you said to start the show, the expectation would be that a candidate for president by the Democrats or vice president would get around 40 or 41 percent of the vote. <laughs> the vice president, Vice President Harris, is going to end up with 48 percent of the vote which means for the first time in modern history, she's going to outrun the incumbent president's approval by eight points. That's never happened before, never happened at all. And one of the things I think that we that we have to understand is with that in case, you look at every geography, you look at all the demography, and you say what happened. The most predictive result, most predictive factor of how people voted, no matter who they were, was their approval of the president, of President Biden. And so for me, when you look at this, and the interesting thing is in the seven swing states, uh, the vice president ran four points better than she did in all the other states when you look at where Donald Trump gained, which means he gained seven points, Donald Trump gained seven points in all the other 43 states and only gained three points in the swing states, which means her campaign worked. It just couldn't overcome the weight and anchor of Joe Biden's approval number. And that's fine. We, we might argue with whether voters should or should not. But when you're a voter who's out there trying to make a decision and he, they can't pay the rent, as you say, they can't, the groceries are too expensive, they don't know what they're going to do about health care or daycare, they have all those things, and they're being told, oh, forget about all that, vote, quote, unquote, on behalf of democracy. Well, we might think as individuals who are blessed in our lives that we're able to overcome that and we can we'll be able to do that. But most people in their lives have to focus on just what's right in front of them and their feeding of their children and the care of their parents and all of that. And so that's fundamentals, the perception of the economy, which then moves into the per perception of the incumbent vice uh, incumbent president, means that, that Vice President Harris actually way overperformed what you would expect.